All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Carla Rose Hansen. I'm a representative from District 44. I think I know most of the people um, who have joined us today, and we'll probably have a few more join us as we as we get started. Mm -hmm. um, I'm joined by Representative Josh Boucher and Senator Merrill Pepcorn, and uh, we're really glad that you're spending our Saturday morning with us. Uh, what we're going to do today is um, give you some legislative updates, just talk for a few minutes. Uh, we'll, each of us will talk briefly about uh, some of the latest happenings at the Legislative Assembly, uh, and, but then we'll reserve quite a bit of time for questions and answers because we want to make sure that we're covering what you want to know about. So, um, so again, welcome and Let's see, uh, there's a chat function. Um, if you could mute for now, I think everyone's muted uh, just until we get to the Q&A time, that would be great. Um, like I said, we're going live on Facebook right now. We're also recording it so that people who uh, weren't able to join us this morning can watch it later. Um, so I'll just briefly say that right now, uh, the legislature is in crossover. Uh, what this means is that this is the, the end of sort of like the, the first of three periods during the legislative session. Um, the first period is when uh, each chamber hears bills from their own chamber. So the House has just gotten done hearing, uh, having hearings for and voting on all the House bills. And the Senate just got done having hearings and voting on all the Senate bills. And whatever passes in those chambers now will cross over and have another hearing and another vote in the opposite chamber. So we call this crossover because the bills are crossing over. Uh, the, the second period will be um, you know, where they have the hearings and votes in the opposite chamber. The third period of the legislative session is when we resolve any differences between the two versions that might pass each chamber. So if, uh, each chamber passes slightly different versions of the same bill, then we create a conference committee with members from each chamber to resolve the differences and hopefully come up with a great compromise uh, because each chamber has to pass the exact same language in order for a bill to become law. So you'll see the third period be uh, full of conference committees where, where we do that work. Uh, so that's kind of where we are, are in the legislative session is we're at the end of the first period and, uh, you know, many bills have been defeated, but qu quite a few more have passed. Um, and so what we'll do today is just kind of give some highlights of some of the bills that have passed, um, some of the concerning bills that, that might have been defeated, or some missed opportunities, some good bills that were unfortunately defeated. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Josh Boucher and ask him to uh, kind of start us off with some comments about where we're at. Thanks, Carla. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am at my workplace trying to use one computer and it froze up on me. So uh, hopefully we don't have any feedback or anything while I'm in my office. Um, great, to, great to see you all. Even more great for us to be home. Um, as I messaged some other folks, uh, all three of us are safely in North Fargo uh, after quite uh, a long week. Um, this uh, week before crossover is always intense in terms of trying to get a lot of work done. Um, but this was my first experience in serving uh, since 2012 in which we spent two full days on the House floor, just basically a vote-a-rama. Um, and so on Tuesday, we voted for, uh, we voted on 80 some bills and uh, then to clean up everything to get out of there by Wednesday evening in the House, uh, we did another 50 votes. So um, a lot of information uh, being thrown at us. And you know, I don't think it's the best way of making decisions because we had to make 130 quick decisions um, in a short period of time. And uh, you know, the advantage to the North Dakota legislative system is that every bill that's introduced has a hearing and has a vote. So every idea has the ability to have deliberation. That's good. The hard part with that is when 
you know, 141 legislators each have 10 great ideas that quickly adds up to a lot of bills uh, that we have to make decisions on. And so, um, as Carla indicated, we'll certainly be talking about the good, the bad, and uh, the missed opportunities. Um, I'm going to highlight a little bit about the budget uh, at crossovers. Uh, so what happens is each legislative legislative Senate or session, the Senate takes half the agency budget bills and the House takes the other half. They alternate each session. So for instance, this year, the House got to start with the K-12 DPI budget. Now that's going over to the Senate. The Senate started with the higher ed budget. That's now coming over to the House. Um, and, and there's already differences between uh, the House and Senate versions. And, and the biggest difference there is uh, compensation for public or for state employees. Uh, the House, uh, the Senate has decided that uh, our, our hardworking state employees uh, should receive a minimum of 2% each year of a salary increase. Uh, also continue maintaining their fully paid health benefits um, and no additional contributions to retirement. The House uh, has always tried to use leverage against the Senate. Uh, the House appropriations, uh, the Republicans on there passed a one and a half percent increase each year for our state employees. So the budgets are crossing over, uh, they're gonna have different numbers. And so that creates even more kind of disruption in how we do our budgeting. But if we were to have walked away from the legislature today or yesterday, um, we are currently $753 million in the hole. Uh, in North Dakota, like most states are required to have a zero balance budget at the end of um, uh, the session, so we cannot have a deficit. Uh, we use a lot of creative accounting in uh, the North Dakota legislature to make sure it's not zero balance or to make sure it is zero balance, uh, but technically it ends up being some form of deficit spending. And what's helped us through that is, of course, the energy sector uh, and, and at times the strong egg economy because um, energy specifically fills up a lot of buckets, a lot of reserve accounts outside of our general fund that we then sweep in on the last day of the, of the budget cycle uh, to, to get us to that zero number. That $753 million uh, deficit, um, we don't get too, in, too much anxiety about because like I said, there's some savings accounts we already know about and how they're doing that would sweep over. Um, but also the reconciliation between the House and the Senate in terms of uh, salary compensation for our public employees. Uh, you know, the House right now has passed out a 0% increase for per pupil payments to our K-12 system. I assume the Senate's gonna say, no, we need to give some sort of increase. Um, <clears throat> and so that could create uh, additional budget uh, impacts. And, and so as Carla talked about, the second and third period become the most intense because not only do we have to, in each chamber, deliberate what happened in the other chamber, but also uh, trying to get some final resolution all within 80 days. Um, and our goal this year is to try to only use our low 70s because as the federal government continues to uh, deliberate on uh, additional rescue packages or relief packages to state and local government, um, the legislature is unified in not wanting the governor to have sole discretion of what could be anywhere from 500 million to over $3 billion showing up in North Dakota from the federal government in the next few months. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're using our legislative prerogative to, uh, to delegate that money and make sure it's appropriated to programs. Um, the, the big budget uh, items, uh, most of them have, have come out of the House. So there's been a lot of discussion around infrastructure bonding. Um, and you know the, uh, the, as the House Minority Leader, we had a package that we proposed from the Democratic NPL. Uh, my GOP colleagues had their package um, based on the math of the legislature. Of course, the, the Dem NPL package was not passed, but it was it was uh, it was used as leverage uh, by both the Senate and, and in the House Appropriations Committee. So um, a lot of what ended up in the House GOP bill is similar to uh, what we wanted within um, the minority party. And so what that package looks like is um, right now it's at about six hundred and eighty million dollars of bonding. And as a quick refresher, a bond is essentially the government taking out a loan and using long-term payments to reduce costs overall and get cash out the door today. 
Um, the biggest winner in that is the FM diversion. Um, the diversion has, you know, had what we call legislative intent, meaning that the legislature has said for future legislatures, please contribute money to this, but we can't obligate future sessions to that. Um, but that obligation was $66 million for the next um, several biennium until I think it was either 2031 or 2033. What we've done uh, with the House uh, infrastructure package is the commitments made for that period of time, it's about 600 or 400 some million dollars is gonna go out the door on July 1st. So we're gonna borrow money so that we can pay that money up front, get it to the diversion. The diversion now has its commitments from the federal government and the state government, which will help bring down costs uh, for the private infrastructure or the private entity that's coming in to um, finance the project. Uh, so it, it means we get guaranteed jobs out the door. Uh, we can start, you know, dirt's already moving on the project. Uh, they can move a little bit faster and not wait for some of the political games that may happen in Bismarck or in Washington, DC. So it's a good thing because that's gonna save money for all of us. But the bigger win is for the rest of the state because <clears throat> the $66 million and we, you know, bar the diversion keeps coming and asking for more because costs continue to increase due to inflation. Um, that 66 million that we dedicated over the next several biennium now is cleaned out. That obligation isn't there, meaning that smaller rural projects around the state have access to that money. Uh, the big political pressure point has been that the commitment made to the FM diversion has blocked out a lot of other projects because the money hasn't been there in the resources trust fund due to lower um, energy prices and, and, and oil tax revenue. So um, it ends up being kind of a big win-win uh, because no longer is Fargo or, or the Red River Valley seen as always getting everything and other communities don't get things. Um, so this is, is hopefully streamlining some of that and taking that pressure off and then providing much more opportunities to rural water districts to making sure that, you know, St. Anthony or St. John's up in northern part of North Dakota, you probably read the story two weeks ago that their their water um, tank, uh, or, or if we, I'm using the wrong word, but the, the big water, the water tower, thank you, the water tower um, is froze up and it's leaking and it's a big problem for that community and there's no really other way for them to get water. Uh, so this type, this frees up for programs and projects like that. So um, beyond that, uh, there also has been a lot of discussion about the legacy fund earnings, uh, the interest and how we use that. Um, again, uh, the majority party's version of that bill passed. Um, ours was used in the Senate as leveraged against the House uh, GOP. Uh, so again, some good things coming out of there. The big buckets that um, are being prioritized there is to pay off the infrastructure bonding. So about $30 million a year um, going to help pay down that debt service. Um, but then um, some regional economic development projects, uh, some money set aside to help with uh, commercialization of some North Dakota based businesses. Uh, but the biggest I think win is um, the legacy fund right now is over $8 billion. And that money is invested much like you know, maybe your retirement package or other uh, funds that you have invested. And we depend on, on managers basically in Washington or in New York City uh, to, to invest that. Um, one of the bills we passed out of the house is to say, let's, there's a, a small portion that we put in what's called fixed assets. That's infrastructure. Um, so we are helping give money that are then returned back to, to our fund at a low interest rate for projects in New York City. Washington State, uh, China, Africa. I mean, countries borrow this money and, and but very little of that ever shows up in North Dakota in terms of helping keep our costs down for infrastructure. So what we've done is pass legislation that would say that the investment of part of a very small part of the legacy fund has to be prioritized in North Dakota. So that's gonna help community counties, cities borrow money at a lower interest rate. We'll get a little bit lower return on the fund, but we see it as a cost savings because it helps with, again, water projects, bridge projects, roads in North Dakota, which hopefully will reduce pressure on property tax payers. So that's uh, those are some of the big things we've been talking about financial wise. Um, certainly I can answer questions at the end about more budget items. Uh, wanna make sure Meryl and Carla have an opportunity to keep talking, so. 
you, Josh. Uh, we are very uh, grateful for Josh's uh, deep understanding about the budget process. Um, it's it's uh, he's a real asset when it comes to um, understanding the big picture. Um, what I can do is I can talk about some of the policy bills that have been coming through, uh, especially on the House side. Uh, as we mentioned at the very beginning, there's some good bills that we were very glad to see move forward. There's some bad bills that we were, were very concerned that are moving forward. And then there were some good bills that were defeated and we're um, sad to see that because it's a real missed opportunity for helping North Dakotans. So I'll, I'll talk about it in, in that framework. Um, some, some good bills that have passed uh, are related to healthcare. Uh, as you know, um, the, as you probably know, the human services uh, part of North Dakota's uh, state government is one of the biggest areas of our budget. And that includes money for uh, behavioral health, uh, funding for our nursing homes, and of course, reimbursement for our uh, healthcare providers on Medicaid and Medicare. That's a huge part of it. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to provide strong funding, especially in the Medicaid and Medicare, because uh, not only does that help individuals in North Dakota, especially those who uh, can't afford health insurance, but it also supports our critical access hospitals across the state. And it really ensures that people across the state, and especially in rural areas, can continue to have access to health care. And that's, that's really important. Um, not only for the well-being of people, but for uh, the health of our communities. People don't want to live in a town that doesn't have a clinic or doesn't have access to a hospital nearby. Uh, so that the human services budget did pass the House and now it goes over to the Senate. Uh, they will uh, for sure make some adjustments and then that will go to a conference committee and be one of the last bills that we vote on, probably uh, one of the last few bills that we vote on in April. Um, also in the realm of healthcare, there's been several efforts to reduce the cost and increase the transparency related to healthcare. Uh, a, a significant bill did pass the House that uh, requires more transparency on prescription drug prices. Uh, the, the goal of that is really to avoid the, um, the sharp increase in prices for, for prescription drug prices. So we were really pleased to see that. I know some of the people who are listening today were strong advocates for that bill. We got a lot of communication from our district about how people who are on fixed incomes, who uh, have a lot of needs related to prescription drugs, really uh, felt this bill was an important step. So thank you to everyone for reaching out about that bill. Uh, there was also several bills related to diabetes treatment. Um, I brought forward a bill that requires Medicaid to cover something called continuous glucose monitors. There are little things uh, that people with diabetes use to um, have better health outcomes, uh, ha uh, handle their diabetes better. And it also saves costs in the long run because they uh, will prevent a hospitalization or um, ER visit uh, because of uh, a bad um, direction with their blood glucose levels. Um, that did pass the House and now goes to the Senate. Um, it, it's only affecting kids. It, got, it did get scaled back a little bit in committee, so it, it only covers uh, children who are covered by Medicaid, not, not all people, uh, but it's a great first step for those individuals. Um, on, on the uh, missed opportunity category with diabetes care, there was a, uh, a bill on the Senate side that would have capped the price of insulin for people with diabetes. Um, that bill was also watered down in committee uh, originally, the bill would cover anyone, uh, all health insurance plans, and cover both insulin and supplies. The committee narrowed it to be uh, just insulin and only public employees. Um, and then the Senate uh, defeated the bill on the floor. So that was very disappointing to the uh, people, the families across North Dakota who struggle with diabetes um, and 
hopefully we can continue to make movement on that in, in future sessions. Um, some other policy areas uh, include gambling. We had probably five or six bills related to gaming in the house. Uh, two of them put measures on the ballot. One is putting online poker on the ballot uh, and one is putting uh, a sports betting on the ballot. So we need to uh, amend our constitution to allow this expansion of gaming. And if we amend the constitution, uh, the people have to approve that. So that's why it would go on the ballot. Uh, both of those resolutions did pass the house and now they go over to the Senate. If the Senate passes them, then they would go on the ballot. Uh, the House also approved what we call enabling legislation for those two uh, types of gaming, both uh, um, online poker and sports betting. Uh, enabling legislation basically fills out all the details in state statute related to how it would be regulated and how it would be taxed. Uh, sort of the pros and cons of the gaming issue is uh, proponents say it's being done anyway online so by, by North Dakotans so let's regulate it to make sure it's done kind of safely and done well and let's tax it so that the state can bring in revenue. Uh, people who are against the measures uh, are concerned about the impact it could have to charitable gaming revenue. Um, a lot of our charities rely on uh, gaming revenue to support their efforts uh, as charities. And there's also concerns about the impact it could have to the tribal uh, gaming, the tribal casinos that uh, in their communities that rely heavily on, on their gaming revenue. So those are sort of the pros and cons of um, the gaming issues. Um, as, a, as another category, we also, uh, a lot of people had their eyes on, uh, will the legislature legalize recreational marijuana or adult use marijuana? Uh, as you know, there was an uh, initiated measure some time ago uh, that did not pass out the ballot. Uh, and there's talk about another initiated measure coming forward. So a lot of legislators uh, have the mindset that rather than having something pass out the ballot, that they feel is too uh, lenient or too broad, uh, they should be proactive and create a policy that's a little bit more narrow, a little bit more limited on what's allowed with recreational marijuana or adult use marijuana, um, and let's regulate it and tax it the way we want to, rather than kind of letting the people decide. So even people who might not be uh, normally favorable to the idea of recreational marijuana uh, did vote for this bill because they um, they want to see it be uh, moving forward in a limited way rather than a broad way. Uh, so that bill did pass the North Dakota House along with a companion bill that uh, uh, sets out the taxation model for marijuana. So those are some of the, the kind of the major bills that we dealt with. We also dealt with some bad bills related to expanding uh, gun rights in North Dakota. Some of those failed. Uh, a few of them did move forward and um, will now go to the, the Senate. So um, so that's my update and I'll, I'll hand it over to Merrill too. Hey, thank you, Carla and Josh. And of course, Josh was first elected in 20, 2012, I think, yeah. And so this is his third uh, term and uh, I guess fifth the leader of the minority party, that's the MNPL party in the house. And, you know, as such, we really rely on Josh because uh, he <laughs> putting a little bit more responsibility on you than you, maybe you realize Josh here, but we, we, we lean on Josh and in the Senate, uh, own Heckman leader in the Senate who really kind of keep tabs on all the committees and all the bills. And of course, and we have uh, representatives on, on all of those committees and such, all funnels through that office. So the, so the leaders in each party uh, really get a lot of information coming their way and, and uh, depend on them for the view on some of the big, bigger and broader issues. For example, I serve on two committees uh, finance and uh, 
taxation. And the other one is natural resources, energy. Oh, by the way, Lori Klein, I think there should be a rule in the Senate where we can, we can have cats on the Senate floor. I think everybody would calm down a little bit, I think, when things get a little contentious. They should just have some around and just get, okay, cat the, to the Senator from Tioga. All right, bring him a cat and okay, everybody relax. But uh, uh, so there are some big policy issues, you know, like Carla mentioned, and then there are, there are uh, smaller bills that people that introduce uh, for constituents. Now I'll, I can take care of those as they come my way on committee, but we do need to rely on our leadership and our regular caucus meetings to get updated. You know, regardless of party, you have your leadership, you have your caucus meetings and that's I'm uh, Carla and uh, and Josh touched on some of the big issues. I I will uh, uh, repeat that uh, you know the gaming issues. You know we used to be fairly prudish here in North Dakota for blue laws and and uh, regulations on bars and you know the store openings and everything. And we are really opening up. I think some of it has to do with you know collecting taxes on these things and, and uh, you know whether it be. Uh, you know, raising taxes on sin taxes, raising taxes on cigarettes or uh, alcohol and, and drinking, but they were also being more liberal in, in Sunday opening now. There's a, a bill went through the Senate to allow bars to open at 8 a.m. on Sundays. It wasn't too long ago. They weren't open on Sundays at all, or you couldn't buy a six-pack of beer on a Sunday. And now uh, a law coming your way in the House, Josh, is to open the bars at 8 a.m. on the premise that these businesses suffered during uh, the pandemic closed down here and uh, that we have something to help them out. Uh, an example of that sort of legislation. And then uh, on tax and finance, I deal with a lot of the gaming issues that Carla mentioned. And it's kind of unfortunate. I Personally, and it doesn't make much difference, my, my personal view, because it's water under the bridge, is that I wish, I wish charities uh, didn't have to rely on gaming, got into it, and they're very dependent on gaming now to, to fund their programs. Of course, it allowed them to expand those programs as well. Uh, charities and nonprofits, not all, not all uh, people engaged in gaming are charities. But a lot of it comes down to head knocking between the tribes and the state charities, because the tribes also are six reservations in North Dakota. Uh, also rely heavily on gaming casinos, as a matter of fact. And of course, they've really, they've really taken a hit as far as attendance goes. And so they're, they're clashing over, you know, we want online gaming. The charities would go, we want online gaming. Well, maybe everybody can have it. The tribe wants the charities to have a limit on e-tabs. They're, they, they really do act like, uh, like uh, bot machines, but, uh, the, they were they become much more popular than popular than anyone ever envisioned, and the tribes think that that's siphoning away a lot of the business. So, you know, and we have to decide well who's who's going to win this one and who's going to take a hit on. It. So, uh, heavy decisions that we all make in in all of our committees a lot. I think one of the interesting bills that came through the Senate was uh, something that uh, Representative Hansen has been. Uh, promoting the past couple of sessions, and that's annual sessions of the legislature. Now, one member, uh, uh, Brad Beckadall, Senator from Williston, introduced that bill this year. And uh, one Senator who began that session in the Senate present uh, had to leave somewhere before this was introduced on the floor. So that left 46 senators on the floor and the bill wound up a 23-23 tie. Well, in that case, the president of the center, Senate, who is the Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford, he has the option of voting or not. Last year, he chose not to vote on the seatbelt law when that, uh, when that came to a tie in the Senate. And he did vote this time in favor. So the bill passed that day uh, to, uh, to look into uh, annual sessions. Then the next day, the senator who was absent came back and asked, you can ask to uh, reconsider a bill, and often that will change maybe the outcome of the uh, of the vote the previous day. It did not. More people voted for annual session this time, you know, when it was brought up again than they did the first time. So that was that was fairly interesting. And 
And on the same day, I can't even remember the bill right now, but the president of the Senate also had to, to uh, cast a vote to break another tie in the Senate. And again, the same senator brought that back, wanted to vote on it again the next day, and, and the yes votes to pass it were, again, greater than they were the first time. You know, um, I want to tell you that on the uh, on the Senate uh, Natural Resources and uh, and uh, Energy Committee, excuse me, uh, we receive everything from uh, personal bills. Like uh, one senior citizen wanted uh, to have anybody seventy five years or older to have their name in a drawing for a moose tag, have two two chances rather than just one. Well, that was a bill introduced on behalf of one constituent. Um, and on, on the other hand, and that bill passed, by the way, through the Senate, you'll be getting that one. On the other hand, we deal with taxation issues regarding the oil and coal industry and the fossil fuel industry. And uh, it does seem that uh, the committee heavily favors uh, investing in coal and uh, Doing, doing what they believe North Dakota uh, owes it to the coal industry to keep that struggling industry, struggling nationwide, to keep it alive. And a flurry of bills uh, came in at, on the last two days of our committee meetings, and then a flurry of amendments at the very end. And uh, it just, it just sort of, it just sort of steamrolls on through, and it'll go on to the House. And you're going to be spitting a lot of those bills over there in the House as well. Uh, uh, one interesting note to, I think, all of us here, uh, most of us are in Fargo, and it's of interest to you anyway, uh, there's a Senate bill, 2139, that got passed, that is basically expanding the idea of the Renaissance Zone, which many credit the revival of downtown Fargo to the Renaissance Zone. There's been a lot of building, you know, Fargo looks kind of like a, like a main street that maybe it did in the, in the 60s. Uh, the businesses are a little bit different. They're a little bit uh, more unique. They're a little bit more specialty shops than the big department stores like Penny's and Sears and the big hardware stores and such. But it, it looks pretty good down there. And uh, there's a bill, Senate Bill 2139, that is expanding that concept of the Renaissance Zone to neighborhoods to make it uh, easier to invest in improvement of neighborhoods. And that, that, a lot of that has to do with housing too. And I've been involved in the uh, the neighborhood the neighborhood uh, planning uh, committees that uh, have assembled now a, a long range plan for for the core neighborhoods in Fargo, Forest Man, Clara Barton, Belt, and uh, it'll be interesting. I don't know much about this bill, but the uh, core neighborhood planning uh, sessions went pretty well, and there are a lot of good ideas in that. That's going to be making the news in Fargo here soon, and I have work to do, and as you will, in the house, it'll be directly affected by this, the Senate Bill 2139, uh, expanding on that, uh, on the, on the uh, zone, kind of expanding the, the neighborhood. Well, that, that's enough. We might have more to add. I've got other things to talk about. It's interesting. It, it, it is, it, it is weighing on, uh, on our shoulders. We, there is a lot of responsibility. It's very enjoyable. It's very satisfying and rewarding work, but uh, definitely a much needed break here. It's good to be home, uh, being with the people that we live with and that we live in, and kind of get geared up and charged up for the next session, which does again move rapidly. So thank you for attending everybody. And uh, thanks really to people who really stay in, in contact. I see the Warners are here. They're very, uh, diligent about staying in contact with our uh, legislators. I'm going to give you one more example, then I'll, I'll shut up here for a minute. But I had an email from a constituent who said, my daughter, who's a teacher, and my wife, who has at least two underlying health conditions, is they have not gotten their first vaccine. I just got this a couple of days ago, get prisoners in the uh, state penitentiary in Bismarck. Uh, have been already afforded the opportunity to get the first round of vaccine. And he was upset with that. Well, what can I do about that personally? I forwarded his email to the governor. I forwarded his concerns to the Department of Corrections. And I didn't think of this till later. I, bet I will forward that email to the 
Department of Health. <clears throat> so then they at least get uh, a concern, get this constituent's concern with, with the problem. So that's what we can do. So, well, not solve people's problems all the time, but point them in the right direction. And oftentimes there's resolution. We have a lot of good people working for capital. Okay, thanks, Carla. All right, thank you um, both Josh and Merrill for your updates. Um, I have started to get some questions. So let's move into the Q&A portion of our forum. Um, if you have a question, you can, um, I, I'm not seeing our, the raise hand feature in our view of the Zoom. So just go into chat and type your question and we'll, we'll get to it that way. Um, or we can, um, or if you're not able to do the chat, you can also, um, uh, unmute yourself when we after we deal with the first couple questions and um, and you just ask your question. So uh, the first couple questions we have are around higher ed. So I thought I'd first start by giving just a quick update uh, about some of the bills that do impact our higher ed community. Uh, first of all, there's the higher ed budget. That's um, Senate Bill 2003. So that started on the Senate side. Now it moves over to the House side. Uh, Earlier in 2020, the, uh, the Board of Higher Ed proposed a needs-based budget. Uh, that was in um, contrast to what the governor asked our higher education institutions to put forward. He had asked, along with the other agencies in state government, to put forward a draft budget that had cuts involved. And I think, and I believe, the, he had asked the higher ed uh, institutions to come in with a 10% cut, if I recall. Uh, and that would have, of course, resulted in a lot of uh, elimination of positions across our 11 institutions across the state. And there's great concern about this because as many of you know, uh, our higher education institutions have endured several deep cuts over the last couple sessions. And so the concern here was that we're now going to start having to eliminate programs um, and it would just be way too deep. So the higher ed, uh, the Board of Higher Ed advanced a needs-based budget instead that did not reflect the governor's request for a 10% cut. Um, and this, the, the bill, Senate Bill 2003 that the uh, Senate just approved did uh, largely reflect that needs-based budget in what they passed and so that was that was very positive news. Um, uh, the higher ed board was really happy to see that. Um, two other bills also got dealt with uh, either in the House or the Senate over the last couple of weeks that impact our campuses. One is Senate Bill 2030, I believe. It's, um, it's a bill that funds a very popular uh, scholarship program called, um, oh, now I just gapped out on the name of the, um, the Challenge Grant Program. and. Uh, super popular program across of our campuses. And uh, one of the unique features of the North Dakota legislature is um, that the Senate is able to amend bills on the floor. The House can only amend bills in committee. Uh, so what happened with Senate Bill 2030 is that one Senator uh, amended this bill related to scholarships, challenge grants, to restrict the ability for our higher, our higher ed institutions to partner with any organization that deals with abortion. Uh, and so many of you might know that NDSU has a partnership uh, with Planned Parenthood uh, using federal funding to help research uh, sex ed programs, uh, you know, a research-based comprehensive sex ed programs for at-risk youth. Mm -hmm. um, this has been around for since maybe 2013, I think. And uh, this attempt to uh, prohibit this partnership has been made before by this particular senator. Uh, and it went all the way to the attorney general of North Dakota, who made an opinion that that this couldn't be done, that it, you know, it infringes on academic freedom, really. So, uh, so this is being attempted again. It did pass the Senate, and now it will be uh, looked at in the House, and we're hopeful that we can uh, uh, fix the problem with that. 
Um, another bill that affects college campuses is House Bill 1503. So that just passed the House, and now it goes to the Senate. 1503 uh, deals with free speech on campuses. Some of you might know that in 2019, uh, we did pass a bill that required our 11 higher ed institutions to create policies, uh, uh, free speech policies on each campus. And they did in 2019, each campus did uh, enact very thorough free speech policies. Uh, so House Bill 1503 kind of blindsided the higher ed institutions because they're like, well, we did what you asked. We put into place these, these uh, free speech policies. And um, the bill was further amended on the in the House committee to actually qualify or limit academic freedom. Uh, and it sort of duplicated some of the, the policies. And of course, it's a lot harder to change state statute than it is to uh, update and modernize maybe uh, policies. And so we'd be a lot less nimble. We'd be a lot less able to uh, keep things updated uh, and reflecting the current needs if we did things in statute instead of policy. So. So there's a lot of concerns expressed about 1503, especially about um, the, the effects to academic freedom and for our faculty and staff, uh, but it did pass. And so now we'll, we'll deal with that in the, in the Senate side. Um, so that's, that's kind of the broad implications on some of the higher ed uh, things. And I want to just offer the opportunity to, um, now I'm looking for her, um, Birgit, if Birgit had any additional questions, there you are, Birgit. Um, any additional questions uh, on, I know you had a question about salaries on nine month faculty, and so go ahead on that. Yeah, okay, thanks for the summary. I mean, that already explains a lot. I had sent her my three questions privately. So the salary issue is one that was probably not intentional, and I do not think that legislators are necessarily aware of it. Last time there was a cap visit. And that meant up, um, up to $120,000, people got the 2%. And on top of that, it was a little bit less. The way that worked out is that most of our faculty are actually nine months faculty. And since it wasn't like $2,000, like, it wasn't like $120,000 a year, but $2,000 a month, they multiplied that by nine. When I already put the cap at less than that. In addition to that, we only got three quarters of the race. So I'm wondering whether there's a way to phrase this differently and not say the cap is this many per dollar per month, but per year, so that it doesn't matter whether somebody is a nine months or 12 months faculty. So for, for me, I don't care, but I mean, for many people, it, it does make a difference. And there was a little bit of a sour taste because it's also not exactly merit pay anymore then. Um, I appreciate flagging that. And since it's coming over to the house side, we'll make sure we connect with Tammy Dolan at the University System Office. I assume they've been made aware of that concern and they can help us draft the language that would, necess that would make that work. Yeah, I mean, last time I was the faculty advisor on the State Board of Higher Education, I picked up on it really late, it was too late. And then I kept pestering the system office and they were like, oh, we don't know. We need to talk to legislators. And I really think it was unintentional. Yeah. It's but I can talk to Tammy and make sure that she has it on her radar also, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's an example of, uh, you know, we're all citizen legislators. Uh, we only know sometimes the world view or the professional experiences we have. And uh, uh, with how quick things move in our legislature, I think often minor mistakes like that, that have big impacts in certain people's lives. Um, you know, that's why I'd be much more of an advocate of a, you know, instead of just passing amendments that uh, once a bill is amended, you have 24 hours before a committee can vote on it because there's so many times we're passing amendments yeah, yeah. bills and we have no impact. So we'll work on that. Certainly. I did not think it was intentional. I think it's somehow right. slipped through. And I know that outside academia, nobody knows what a nine months appointment is. Exactly. Yep. It, it's a very unique kind of thing, but it impacts a lot of us. <laughs> the other thing is 2030. Yeah, I know there are people who don't like abortion, but you know there are people who don't like Monsanto. I don't. 
So there is a little bit of a precedent scene here. If the next person says, I don't like some health profession company that half of pharmacy college is selling their products to, or all the egg varieties, GMOs that we are producing for the farmers in North Dakota, certainly can't do that anymore because some legislator doesn't like Monsanto. I mean, that is dangerous. The other thing, if Brishani says, okay, that grant is closed so that we can get the challenge grant funding, he has to violate university policy. If he doesn't want to do that, we are punishing our students. The challenge grant is for students, it's not for faculty. The people who are being punished with that are not the same people who caused it. And it is academic freedom and freedom of speech and all those kinds of things. So I would really appreciate whoever works with it next that, I mean, I will also testify against that amendment and Senate is working on something at numerous institutions. So there is, that has definitely caused quite some uproar among the campuses. 1503 is one I've worked with extensively last time. I was at, did testify, was at the committee hearing. I was actually happy with the outcome of the policy and I gave our institutions and the system office in the SBHE a lot of credit to get it done by August. I mean, they wanted 12 new policies between July and August. So that was a big thing to do those. And I, I thought that the bill was a good compromise. I didn't expect Ray Holmberg to give up on it though. So, I mean, it's not entirely unexpected that he's trying it again. The change he wants to say is, I mean, last time it was free speech and if it's free speech, it should apply to everybody, including faculty. So yes, it does apply to faculty, according to the American Association for University Professors, faculty have the right to free speech. Now comes the amendment, unless they talk about something that's not related to the course topic on a repeated basis or so. And I think Ray had initially even put in some dollar amount in there, which has come down a lot from the 100,000 originally. I think it was down to 5,000 by now. So that, but that did not get approved by the House. So I think um, the Senate gets it without that. But they still have that provision in there unless they do something in their classroom that the students disapprove of. And it's kind of vague, and then you don't know who decides whether it was appropriate or inappropriate, and what if the student is unhappy with their grade and just try to get back at the professor that way. I mean, there are all sorts of unintended consequences, and I'm I'm think free speech is important, but I really think it should apply to everybody. Thank you, Birgit. Yeah, we, we share your concerns about that bill. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we have another question um, in the chat around the marijuana bill that we passed. Um, so I'll, I'll share what I know and Josh, maybe you can add on to it since uh, it also went through the house and, and you saw it as well. So the question is what kind of provisions are there for decriminalization, possession of paraphernalia and expunging of criminal records? If you could uh, mute, that would be awesome. Um, so, uh, in terms of decriminalization, it's it's my understanding that it does. It, it, so it would no longer be a crime to... Uh, Birgit, if you could mute, that would be great. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll mute her. <laughs> um, so uh, the, so it, the bill does decriminalize the possession of a very small amount of marijuana. It would still be a crime, obviously, to possess a lot of it or to deal it, things like that. Uh, but it would no longer be a, a crime to possess a small amount. Um, it, I don't believe it deals with expunging criminal records. We have separately in the past created a process for people to, uh, to, to do that. And um, we first passed that two years ago and it didn't quite work the way it was intended. So just a few weeks ago, we passed a, a separate bill intended to make that process more clear in terms of expunging the criminal record. Uh, paraphernalia, I believe the bill does clarify what, you know, what is, um, is or is not legal on that. Um, another aspect is the bill 
does not allow a person to grow their own marijuana. They have to purchase it from an, a licensed provider. Uh, fairly similar to how we handle things today with uh, medical marijuana. So Josh, I, feel free to add to that description. Uh, the, I think the magic number in terms of decriminalization of, um, of adult use uh, cannabis or adult use marijuana uh, is one ounce or less. Um, as someone who does not regular, you know, has rarely ever consumed uh, any form of cannabis, uh, I have no concept of what one ounce is. So I kept having to ask the bill sponsor and the way he framed it, that still sounds like a, a decent amount that someone could have on their person. Um, the goal is, is to make sure that anyone that's distributing it or selling it, those larger quantities, that that is still um, something that law enforcement will be able to engage in. Uh, but Carla's right, uh, paraphernalia is taken out of there. Um, the one interesting part about the bill, um, so in order to get the bill passed, there had to be a number of restrictions put on it to get support from folks. Um, if our bill passes it, it the Senate, it'll be one of the most restrictive adult use cannabis programs in the country. And, and one of the variables that's on there was flagged to me by one of our North Fargo neighbors who had very big concerns about it. He's an advocate for recreational use, uh, making sure that we expand the medical marijuana program. But what the what uh, 1420 does is anyone that is interested uh, in in purchasing cannabis at one of the dispensaries if this were to pass, you actually have to go through the state, get on a registry, get a card, and then show that card when you purchase your cannabis at the dispensary. Um, so that raises a lot of red flags for a lot of folks, myself included, um, but uh, I still supported the bill. So hopefully in the Senate, we can have more conversations specific to that. I understand that folks want it to be highly regulated. Uh, as they say, we don't want to be Colorado, um, but there's been tens of states that have already passed different versions of this. Um, it's no long, you know, Colorado is one of the first. They had 30 some thousand people move to the state as part of it. That's not going to happen here. Um, but, you know, certainly something that is, is making sure that minors aren't using or misusing, making sure that there's resources in place uh, for folks, but also to allow people to do things in the privacy of their own home, on their own property, um, that most of these folks are already doing. And so all we're doing is providing a pathway for folks to get a safe regulated product um, and, and maybe get a little revenue off of it uh, at, at the state. So um, so yeah, so those are the, it, there's the good and the bad of that bill and we'll see how it flushes out over in the Senate. Awesome, I was, um, I the, well, we don't have a raise hand feature. If you click on the reactions button on the bar across the bottom, there's, there's other little reactions. So, I mean, you could use that if you wanted to, but- uh, I think the Warners just, have a question. Yeah, okay, Warners, go ahead. You could uh, just go ahead or just wave at us too okay. if you, if you hey, want hear? Can you hear okay? We can. Okay, Mike. Good, good. First of all, I wanna thank you guys for what you do. Uh, you're marvelous, you're wonderful. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of the listeners are probably not aware of the fact that, you know, that what you do having regular meetings sending out a newsletter and those kinds of things are not, don't happen in a lot of parts of the state. And I want them to know that and we thank you for that. Also, also wanna thank you for uh, making the legislative session a lot more transparent this session. Marilyn and I have spent hours observing hearing sessions and the general session so we can follow through and watch things and, and uh, zero in on things that, that are really important to us. Another thing that I want to mention just to, for information is for you, Carla, uh, and I don't want you, you don't need to respond to this, but we really feel for the abuse that you received in the uh, lunchroom uh, the other day uh, that was heaped on you and, and felt bad for you. And, and, I, and I'm saddened because uh, from the time that we grew up, uh, you know, we used to have a lot of people that we're sensitive about how we treat each other and that kind of thing. And uh, we also need to wear masks and things like that. And, and uh, it's just, uh, things have really changed a lot in our lifetime and we're saddened about that. And it's not any, it has nothing to do with you. Now, the issue that I wanna deal with is the prescription drugs. And you know that we've been on that issue and we thank you for your involvement and your attention for that. Uh, 
Senator, thank you for the 2170 and, and both of you for the uh, bills that were worked on on the House. No matter what happens on this issue, the thing that we're appreciative of is that it's surfacing, people are talking about it, it's a big deal, and it is a big deal nationally. And it can't, no matter what happens, this can't do anything other than to bring it to better national attention. And believe me, big farmers is watching us. Uh, we watched the hearings, uh, testified in the Senate Human Service Committee hearing. And boy, I'll tell you, they, they came out in powerful numbers to uh, try to explain why they needed to have a monopoly and, and uh, unlimited prices. And in fact, in our testi testifying, one of the examples we used was an eye, eye drop that I use that uh, cost $1,700 for a three month supply for an eye drop that someone, when I contacted someone who was visiting from a South American country, not Mexico, and came in here, we were able to get for $60 for a three month supply as opposed to $1,700 here. And by the way, that, that product from South America was produced in Waco, Texas. Okay, so same product, uh, United States product, $60 a month for three months, as opposed to $1,700. The question, the only question I have today, and I have, could have a lot of them, but what happens, two questions, I guess, what happens when a bill like that you guys passed in the House or in the Senate moves over now that's passed and moves over to the other house. Does it go to a hearing committee? Okay. Then the next question I have is that we've found it very, very challenging for you people in the house to deal with a human service committee on the house side. Really, really, really tough to get them to move on anything on the house side. Because these bills that uh, like 2170 is now going over to the other side. And we found it really, really tough to get any movement at all on a lot of things. And do you have any suggestions in terms of how we might strategize to make, become a winner on that particular committee? Um, well, I'll, I'll make a comment and Josh, I see you unmuted too, but um, so, so first of all, um, around the transparency, yeah, that's been one of the kind of the silver linings of the pandemic, it's really pushed us to accelerate the technology advances that allow people to watch not only the floor session, which has long been available, but um, the committee hearings. And I, we've had a, a lot of people viewing those. And so thanks for being engaged, you guys. Um, it's I think it's best when people are super engaged. I think we create better policy when, when more people know what's happening and, and send feedback to their legislators. Um, to, to build on your question about how you move a committee that might be uh, reluctant or hostile to a certain idea, to me, the best way to do that is to get people in the committee members' districts to contact them uh, with their personal story. So you know, we get a lot of sort of, I'll call them canned messages, you know, canned emails or canned letters. Um, and that's fine. That's great. You know, those are certainly legitimate. Those are people from our district telling us how they feel about a certain bill or a certain issue. What's even more effective is when you get a personal phone call or email uh, from someone in your district with like their personal reason on why they are for or against a bill. And so I've seen hearts change and minds change on committees when someone in their district reaches out to them and says, um, hello, human services community, committee member, I really need you to pass um, House Bill 1288, which provides Medicaid coverage for continuous glucose monitors because my daughter was on the kitchen floor, almost comatose, and asked me to just, mom, just let me go. Just let me go, mom. You know, it's it's a letter that would just break anyone's heart. And um, and it's that personal story. Or maybe it's data if you if that's your 
if that's what moves you is more the numbers or the data, but between the personal stories and the, and the data from people who are in their district, uh, because then they're more likely to know them and more likely to be influenced by them. Um, to me, that's, that's one of the levers that we can use. So, and I'll let Josh build on that. Thank you, Carly. No, that's exactly uh, what I was going to say is really take the time we have now before bill hearings to let those personal connections reach out. Um, you know, I think also a lot of times our, um, the, because of our limited uh, local journalism, you know, a lot of the media comes out of Bismarck and Fargo um, in communities that maybe some of these legislators um, represent, you know, they're not in Fargo or, or Bismarck, they represent another part of the state. And so, you know, if you're working with other nonprofits or other advocacy groups, you know, how do you get stories told that are local in their local newspaper related to the bill? Because that also not only helps the legislators see, oh, this is my neighborhood too. It's not just Fargo families advocating for this or Bismarck families advocating for this. Um, you know, it's the kid next door that I didn't even know had type one diabetes because we don't talk about some of our health. We shouldn't have to talk about our health care, but um, so I think some of those strategies help as well, because not only does that legislator read that newspaper, so do their neighbors and the people they go to church with and they work with, who then talk about that issue being important to their community. Thank you. Yeah. Carla, I just wanted to follow up on uh, one of uh, Mike Warner's questions we didn't touch on is that what happens, Mike, of course, that a bill, Carla mentioned this earlier, a bill gets uh, assigned to a committee it comes out of the committee with a recommendation, goes to the floor of the House, an example, and then gets assigned to a Senate committee. Oh, so, and then out of that committee goes to the Senate floor, if it, if it passes originally in the House. But yes, it does go to a Senate committee. And uh, I do want to just quickly address a concern that uh, Ben Tucker had regarding the uh, college grant program that was brought up earlier, uh, because uh, earlier on the Senate side, a bill passed that would include uh, private colleges in this college grant program. And that's uh, concerning to Ben. We're talking about funding for public schools and, and uh, public universities and colleges And this. I understand the concern. I did personally vote against the bill, including private institutions like Jamestown University and the University of Mary, which are fantastic, uh, fantastic universities. But in my mind, uh, should have been included in this public education bill. And similarly, the Senate did defeat uh, a similar bill allowing for a $3 million pool for private donations to K through 12 schools and uh, tax deductions up to $3 million of fund that would grow. And uh, that bill got defeated. So it's uh, kind of ironic. That's the way it goes. Uh, you just never know what, what, what might happen. Maybe someone offers a persuasive speech. Maybe somebody wants to get out of there that day and uh, votes a particular way. And uh, as you know, again, a little bit separately, a bill can change dramatically from when it is first introduced uh, and then uh, how it winds up after amendments in different ways. Uh, good enough. I hope that answers your question there, there Ben. Thank you. Great, we're, we're at the bottom of the hour, 10.30, but there is one more question I wanna make sure um, gets addressed um, from the chat. Um, Shirley, thanks for the question. There was a bill that prohibits both the state and uh, political subdivisions. So that would be counties, cities, and school districts from adapting, uh, adopting a mask mandate. Uh, that's uh, House Bill 1323. It did pass the House. We were all a little shocked, actually. We thought it was so extreme that, oh, there's no way this is going to pass. And, um, and it did. And so now it, it heads over to the Senate. It will, it will get a hearing. It will get a vote in the Senate. Now that people realize that they, they thought, oh my gosh, this actually did pass, um, more people will be coming out and speaking against it. Um, I know our school districts are extremely concerned about this because masks have allowed kids to be in school. It, it allows us to have in-person schooling. And so our school districts definitely want to keep the mask mandate. Um, you know, city, it's a local control issue too. So if a city like Fargo want to have a mask mandate, this bill would prohibit them from doing that. Um, and I've also heard that the chamber of, the state chamber is also going to oppose this when it goes over to the Senate because, um, 
businesses should be allowed to make that decision as well. So um, I, I'm hopeful that it will be defeated in the Senate. Let me add to that, Carla, that we're looking forward to that bill. And of course, we will uh, we'll personally be working to defeat it. But uh, Representative Marvin Nelson, who's been in the House for many, many years now, said over the years, the Senate has been considered a more maybe level-headed body, <laughs> maybe a little, I don't know, stuffier perhaps, or just more reasonable. But Marvin says, well, this year it doesn't maybe necessarily look like that. So uh, I wouldn't count on the Senate for, you know, taking care maybe of what they're bad. It's interesting, the legislature, many of the legislature preach local control, local control, local control until it just contrasts with their personal beliefs. Then it's like, well, don't worry, we'll step in, tell you how it ought to be. We have to keep our eye on legislation like that as well. You guys, thank you for participating all morning. Um, we're grateful that you've spent part of your Saturday morning with us. Um, Josh and Merrill, thanks for everything. Um, you've contributed to the conversation. Um, our email addresses are on the website. So if you go to legis.nd.gov, uh, you can find our email addresses. Please continue to email us on the issues that are important to you. Um, again, thank you for joining us today and um, have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.